set me free. God has smiled on me. He's been good to me. church and our online family and friends. God has smiled on me. He has set me free. He has been good to me. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight for Bible study. We pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight will come from Psalm 67 verses 1 through 7 in the New Living Translation. Psalm 67, verses 1 through 7. It reads, May God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the earth, your saving power among people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Then the earth will yield its harvest and God, our God, will richly bless us. Yes, God will bless us and people all over the world will fear him. Our song tonight is God has smiled on me. How many of you all know that God has smiled on me? God has smiled on us and he has set us free. God is always watching over us. He's strengthening us and he's loving us. He's helping us to do those things that he has called us to do. God is smiling on us when we praise him, when we give him glory. God smiles on us. We were put on this earth to give God glory, the glory that he so richly deserves. God smiles on us when we live out his purposes for our lives. And I know you know I am just so thankful because God smiled on me, he allowed me to see another birthday on yesterday in which I made 61 years old. And I am just thanking and praising God for that because God has smiled on me. God has smiled on me. He's been good to me. smiled on me. He has set me free. God has smiled on me. He's been good to me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see oh God has smiled on me he's been good to me God smiled on me. He's been good to me. God has, yes, he has. smiled on me. He smiled on me. He has set me free. 
good hands smiled on me. He's been, He's been good, very good, good to, me. to me. Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus of Christ, we come. God, we honor you, we praise you, we magnify you. Lord, we lift you, Father God, for you are worthy of all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. God, we thank you again for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you again, Father God, for giving us another chance to hear from you by way of your word. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless your word. Bless your word, God, to fall on good soil. Bless your word, Father God, that your word will make a difference in our lives. We ask you to forgive us for our sins, forgive us for messing up, forgiving us for willingly messing up, Father God. We ask you to forgive us for messing up without our knowledge. And Lord, we know that you know all things and you see all things. And Lord, we ask you to continue to walk with us. Lord, we praise you and we worship you tonight. And we ask you to saturate us by way of your word that lives will be changed, hope will be renewed, and strength will be made the better. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Oh, God, God has, he has, he smiled on me, he has set me free. Oh yeah, he has. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God has been great. He has been good. He has blessed us to, to the amazement, and he has blessed us, and he has smiled upon us. Yes, and for that, I am thankful. I am grateful. I thank God for who he is and what God has already done. He yes. has blessed us one more again, and I'm, I glorify his name for it. He has blessed us over and over again. Again, we are here tonight in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in the New Testament. The book is 1 Thessalonians, the chapter 4. We will be looking at verses 9 through 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 is where we are tonight. Last two weeks ago, because last week we had some technical difficulties, and we're still trying to straighten that out. But God has blessed us and he has smiled on us. So two weeks ago, we talked about living a holy life, a pure life, and avoiding sexual immorality. We need to avoid sexual immorality. God has blessed us and kept us, and so we want to walk according to his will. So tonight, Paul talks about loving one another, keeping in step with one another looking out for one another. This love that he talks about tonight is brotherly love. And our brotherly love ought to lead us into a conduct that is orderly, a conduct that is praises unto God. Let's look at verse number nine. <clears throat> he says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourself are taught by God to love one another. Verse 10, and indeed, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. The Apostle Paul is talking to those who are born again Christians those who honor Christ. He says to them tonight that I talk to you concerning sexual immorality and sexual impurities in verses one through eight. And tonight he's talking to us about loving other Christians, loving those of the household of faith talks about not only loving other Christians, as we cover this pericope tonight, you will see that he's also talking about loving those who are neighbors, loving those who are not in the family of faith. So let's look at verses 9 and 10. It says, but concerning brotherly love, 
you have no need that I would even write to you. It's not even necessary for the Apostle Paul to write to these born again new converts in Thessalonica because he says they already have love toward each other. What would it be like if every church, every member, every person who is born again had love for every Christian? Only if they just love the brethren. Only if they just only contributed through love for the brothers, for the sisters. If every man would look at a woman as one of their sisters in Jesus Christ, there will be more respect for women. If every woman would look at a brother, a man, as a brother of theirs in Jesus Christ, men would not be fighting for respect. If every church member had respect, brotherly love, this love, this brotherly love comes from the word filio or philia. It is the same Greek word. We get the word Philadelphia, which is the city of brotherly love. If every person would just have love for one another, every Christian, he talks about the Christian in verses 9 and 10. If every Christian would just have love for one another, this would be a better world to live in. This brotherly love would not allow us to gossip about each other. This brotherly love would not allow us to tear each other down. This brotherly love that the Apostle Paul talks about tonight would, would not allow us to do things that will harm other Christians. Paul says to this church, as I would say to every church in this world, you don't have to be written. You don't have to be told to love the brethren. Mm -hmm. We ought not have to be told to love each other. We ought not have to be told to support each other. Paul says to this church, not only should I not have to tell you, but God has already taught you how to love each other. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't have to tell you how to love each other. God has already taught you. You've been taught by God to love one another. He paints the picture of a loving family. As a family in Jesus Christ, we ought to love each other. We are part of the family. When one person in the family hurts, all in the family hurts. Because we have love for each other. When we have love for each other, we understand really, really well that if they're crying, we got to find out why they're crying, not to be nosy, not to gossip, but to support, to pray with them, pray for them, to cry along with them, and to endeavor to encourage them. Brotherly love is, is the topic here tonight. He says to them, you have been taught by God, verse 10, and indeed you do toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, we beseech you, we ask of you, we ask of you, brethren, that you increase more and more. It's not enough to love the same way tomorrow as you love today. Your brotherly love for each other ought to increase more and more. The Apostle Paul uh, urges, he begs, he beseeches us to improve on our love. This word increase comes with the connotation that we ought to improve as we would improve our house or improve on our room. Or if it's clean, it ought to be cleaner. 
He says, we still have room for improve, improvement. Therefore, none of us should be begging somebody to love us because we got brothers and sisters who already love us. Therefore, none of us should be badgering anybody, should not be talking bad to anybody, talking down anybody, or discouraging anybody. And if you're already loving your brothers and sisters of Christ, Paul says, increase more and more. What he's saying is there's still room for improvement. This phrase means that not only is there room for improvement, but there's room for persistence. And there's room for consistency. You have to be persistent in your love. And you have to be consistent in your love. When one person hurt, we all hurt. When one person gets sick, we all are concerned. When one person gets to the point where that person is in need, we all run to their rescue. That's why we have what is called uh, brother and sisterly love. God has taught us this. God has blessed us through this. We can't watch people go down a, a dead end street the wrong way and just say, hey, see you, wouldn't want to be you. It is a family affair. We're in the family of Jesus Christ. And because we're in the family of Jesus Christ, we love each other with a brotherly love like none other. We have a love for each other. It says to us that we have to make sure that love grows, increases more and more. I hear the statement all the time, I love you, and then somebody else say, I love you more. I don't know if that's the, the right phrase or terminology, but the fact of the matter is tonight, Paul points out that we ought to have an increase in our love more and more. We ought to look to increase our love for each other. We ought to look to, to love each other more dearly every single day. We ought not tear each other down. We ought not beat anybody up. We, we ought to love each other. We ought to love each other with a brotherly love. This love that, that God has for us, we ought to have an a unconditional brotherly love for others. Verse number 11 says that you also aspire to lead, uh, uh, to aspire to lead a quiet life. You ought to have a quiet life. You ought to have a life that is quiet, that you won't have any interference with other folk. Look at what he says. He says that you aspire, you look forward to, that you work hard to have a quiet life. In other words, no more drama. You ought to work hard to lead a quiet life. You ought not be the one that stuff, chaos, just rotate around. You ought to have a quiet life, a quiet life where people can look at your life and see a godly example in it. Then he says, to mind your own business, my, my, my. We ought to take six months to mind our own business and six months to leave other folk business alone. The Apostle Paul said we ought to mind our own business. We ought to lead, lead such a quiet life until we mind our own business. Take care of our own business. We ought not be always up in somebody else's business. Ooh, that's terrible speech, but we ought not be tied up in somebody else's affairs. Lead a quiet life. This word quiet, a peaceful, serene life. A life that exalt people and not tear them down. A life that lifts up and not snatch down. We ought to live a quiet life. A life that would not only give us inner quietness, but it will also give out of quietness to our neighbors, out of quietness to our coworkers, out of quietness to our 
fellow teachers and students. There ought to be a quietness within us, an inner peace, a peace is de that is defeating the Christian faith. Christians ought to be quiet to the point where they know when the storm is going on, God is on board. The disciples in Mark chapter 4 had a storm brewing. They had Jesus on board. Jesus spoke peace to the wind and the waves. They began to wonder, what kind of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. But when you got Jesus on board in the midst of the storm, all you got to do is wake him up. All you have to do is call on Jesus. All you have to do is understand that there is peace when Jesus is on board. Our lives ought to be that way. It ought to be a quiet life where we mind our own business. We ought not be busy bodies. We ought not be people who are all tied up in the, in the business of other folk affairs. We ought not get caught up in other people's stuff. Our everyday habits should be living a life of love with brotherly love. This word peace, this word rest, this word quietness is one and the same. We should have a life that is quiet. Now, this word quiet does not mean that you ought not talk. This word quiet doesn't mean that there ought not be any talking but this word quiet means that we ought to be undisturbed in the storm. We ought to be settled. It, it doesn't mean that we ought to, ought to be not talking, but it, it ought not be noisy. The Christian must strive to be at peace with himself and peace with God. This word quiet, it means that that we ought to have a totally supported life where we trust God and our faith holds us up. Mm -hmm. Stay out of others' business. Boy, somebody's jumping for joy today. <laughs> Every time I say, mind your own business, somebody is ecstatic. I'm saying, they're saying, preacher, I'm glad you're telling them because I'm tired of them in my business. So we ought not be busybodies in it other folk affairs. Then the third thing he says in this verse, he says, to work with your own hands. To work with your own hands. What happened when, when Adam got kicked out the garden for sin? God said, you're going to sweat. You're going to work hard for a living. Deliver me from full-grown, healthy men who refuse to work with their own hands. I've always said that as long as I have a good set of hands and a good, strong back, I will have a mind to work. And not only will I have a mind to work, I will get some things done. We have to teach our children how to work with their hands. Regardless of how intelligent they are, regardless of, of how smart they are, we got to teach our children to work with their hands. They have, we have to teach them to be self-sustaining, self-supporting. They have to get to a point where they understand that hard work is not a burden. Right. It's a necessity. Especially young boys, they should not be running for manual labor. The Jews held work, manual labor in great esteem. Men, women, boys and girls got respect in the Jewish community when they worked and they had manual labor on their agenda. Every Jewish boy was taught to trade 
regardless of his family wealth. In other words, if you were born wealthy, you still have to learn how to work with your hands. We got too many spoiled boys. We have too many spoiled girls. We have too many children that are not taught to work with their hands. I've said it before and I say it again. No household ought to employ a yard man when there's a boy 10 years old or older in the house. No household should employ somebody to mow the yard when you have a boy in the house that's 10 years or older. He has to learn how to work early with his hands. The story is told that, that there was a woman who went to the grocery store and she had a two-year-old boy. This two-year-old would get to the counter and the mama would take one can of canned good and put it in a bag by itself and hand it to the boy. When he got five years old, she would take five cans, put it in a bag, and hand it to the boy. So the, the, the clerk asked her one day, why do you keep making this little boy take one bag and carry it to the car when you have a basket that you can put it in? She said, I am trying to teach him how to work when he's two, trying to teach him how to work when he's five, so when he gets to be 15, work will not be strange to him. We have to teach boys and girls how to work with their hands. And we have to start them as early as one, two years old. Because if we do not put that manual label, labor in their hands today, and we do not esteem manual labor today, when they get 15, they'll still be looking for you to carry everything by yourself. Yes. We have to teach little boys today how to open doors for their sisters and their mamas today. At age five, let him go around there and do it. He, he's not going. He's not going to run in the street. He's he, he's he's not going to get caught up. Uh, he's he's not going to get in trouble. Teach him how to open the door for women today. That's right. So when he get 10, 12, 15 years old, 20, 25, he will know the value of manual labor and how to respect women and open their doors. A man who is willing to work with his hands demonstrate brotherly love by doing it humbly. We have to understand that when a man works with his hand as he's willing to do manual labor, then that's a show of brotherly love. He goes on to say, verse number 11, he says, working with their hands, he says, mind your own business. He says, live a quiet life. He talks about increasing your love more and more as we commanded you. He goes from saying God has already taught them how to love each other as Christians. God has taught them how to love each other as Christians. Then he comes back and he says, we, the apostles, we, the, the disciples of Jesus Christ, we, the men of God, has already taught you to make sure that you love everybody as God has trained you. But then he says, we have taught you to live a quiet life. We have taught you to mind your own business. We have taught you to work with your hands. He says, as we commanded you, as we have trained you, as we have taught you. There ought to be some teaching going on, even in the church, where little boys and little girls learn from the saints of God as they see them on Sunday, as they see them on Wednesday, as they see them in the neighborhood. There are so many names that I can call that I patterned my life after during my childhood years because people put us on blast. So, oh no, you're going to get this done. And everybody in the neighborhood had authority to get in our face. You better not get in anybody's face today. 
Don't get it. Don't you dare say anything to my child. And that's why your child is telling you what to do when they get 10. It says to us, we have to train our children. And we have to train them in such a way that they create a pattern while they're young. Yes. And as that pattern is created while they're young, it is carried over into their adulthood life. Right. Paul wants us to show and demonstrate brotherly love and let young people know that I love you. And that's why I'm not letting you get by with this or get away with this. Finally, verse number 12. And you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Look what Paul does here. In this pericope alone, he says, God has taught you brotherly love. God has taught you as Christians to love other Christians. He says, I don't have to write this to you. I, you. You know that God has taught it, and I know that God has taught this to you. He says, because you're Christians, God has taught you how to love each other, and indeed, you do so towards your brethren. Then he says, not only should you love each other as Christians, you ought to love those who are not Christians. You got it down. You, you got it down because God has taught you to love one another. And indeed, you do this. You do this even to those all over Macedonia. But we urge you to increase your love. We, in, we, we urge you to increase your love more and more. In other words, as you increase your love more and more, it's going to go from your household to your neighborhood, to your church, to your city, to your country, to your nation, to the whole world. Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you should be witnesses unto him. You should be witnesses unto Jesus Christ, first in Jerusalem, meaning your little, your little inner circle in Jerusalem, then to Samaria, and then through Judea, Judea, then Samaria, and then to the utmost parts of the world. We have to understand that our missionary journey begins at the house. Right. Our missionary journey of loving begins in our own little small circle. Our own little circle. Our own little circle. It begins at home. Then it spreads abroad. He says, believers ought not be at odds with each other. They ought to show love toward each other. They ought not get upset with every little thing. He goes on to say, you should leave a live a quiet life leaving other folks' stuff alone. Not only should you live a quiet life and leave other folks' stuff alone, you ought to take care of your own business, not other people's business. Mm -hmm. and then he says to work with your own hands. You ought to endeavor to work with your own hands. Work with your own hands. I don't care what disability you have, there ought to be something you can do for the Lord and there ought to be something that you can do for other people. Work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you may walk properly toward those who are outside that you will walk properly. See, when you love each other, Christians, when you love those who are born again, then it will spread to those who are not born again, that you will walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Paul paints a picture here, and the picture he paints is that we're going to lack nothing if we love, first of all, Christians. We're going to lack nothing if we love, secondly, other people who are not Christians. We're going to, we're going to be prosperous. We, we're going to lack nothing. We will have no lack. We quote the scripture all the time. And my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and his glory. But you have to participate with God. You got to participate with him. It says, love the Christian. Love those on the outside, and you will lack nothing. 
That's amazing to me. Whenever you look out for you and you and your family on, only, that's not love. Whenever you got to have the latest and the greatest and somebody else is suffering, that's not an indication of love. We ought to be missionaries on our own soil. We ought to be missionaries that reach out across the aisle, as they say, that reaches beyond the boundary lines and show love for each other. That's right. Apostle Paul says people will know us by living a quiet life, by minding our own business, by working with our own hands. And, and I've commanded this, he says. We have commanded this to you. And he says that you walk properly toward those who are out on the outside, those who are outside, those who are on the outside, those who are not in this Christian battle, those who are not in this Christian walk. Yes. Walk properly before them. God is looking forward to your godly example impacting the lives of those who are not godly. Whose life have you impacted lately? Whose life have you changed by your walk lately? Who has seen God in you lately? Has God appeared to other people through you? Or is everybody looking at you the same way they look at everybody else? Here he says on the outside. Let me just share with you. If you show up in a crowd of people, sometimes... They'll put up their drugs. Sometimes they'll put up their drink. If they don't put up their drugs and don't put up your, their drink, that doesn't mean that you don't have it together. But let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is if you show up and they offer you some drugs, that's a problem. They may not respect you to the point where they put it down. But if they ask you to join in with them, and you have a reputation of joining in with them, that is a problem. Paul says you need to get to a point in your life, in your spiritual walk, where, where you can walk properly. This word walk means lifestyle. This word walk means living, where you can live and have a lifestyle style properly toward those on the outside, those who are outside, those who are not included that you lack nothing. The good news here is, is that when you obey God and do these things, the manifestation of a, of a Christian is the maturity of brotherly love. And the, those who are not saved will see your love. But if they always hear you talking down the church, or they always see you badgering somebody, if they always see you talking down the church, the pastor, and the church folk, then they won't trust you. Because if you're always talking down the church, people are wondering without even asking you, why are you there? And then the second thing they wonder, if those people are so bad and you're hanging out with them, what's your problem? And you're one of them. And when you are one of them, you ought to lift them up. One, th one thing I know, my wife can't talk bad about me because she made the choice. She could have kept on stepping. Now she's in this with me. That's right. And because she's in it with me, I, I, I don't even have to remind her, don't talk bad about your husband now because it's your choice. I don't even have to remind her, don't, don't get crazy with your husband because this was your choice. Mm -hmm. And if you made a bad choice, then guess what? You the fool. <laughs> so we can't badger each other in, in the church. We can't talk bad about each other who are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We cannot turn off each other and just walk away. We have to get in there and show love regardless of what people do to us. Mm -hmm. We have to love them. And when we love them, those on the outside will see our love. And the Bible says right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 12, the Bible says, 
you may lack nothing. I didn't say you, you may not want anything, but the text declares you will have lack for nothing. Thank God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. You won't lack anything. There may be somebody listening to me today that have never trusted Jesus Christ. In this Christianity thing we talk about, you have not engaged with that yet. Let me just tell you, it's not hard to do. It's very simple. You have to trust that Jesus is the son of God. Jesus that died for you. You need to trust that he died over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. You need to trust the fact that he was buried in a tomb, Joseph's brand new tomb. He was buried when they rolled the stone in front of him. A dead man, Jesus. He was all the way dead. Mean men killed him. They buried him. But the good news is early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. This is our hope. This is all we have. We believe that if we believe this story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we can go to heaven when we die. Matter of fact, we will go to heaven if we trust this story to take us from earth to glory. The door of the church is open. If you can believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, that he rose from the dead, you can be saved right here today. If you believe this story, would you bow with me and invite him into your life? Just join me and repeat after me and just tell God that you believe the story. And that you're trusting this story to get you to heaven. Your good looks can't get you there. Your hard work can't get you there. Your living right can't get you there. Your lack of, a, of, of mistreating people can't get you there. The only thing that can get you from earth to heaven, the only thing that can save you from going to hell is Jesus Christ. And it's not anything that you have done. It's what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago on Calvary. He gave his life. He rose from the dead. Would you join me and ask him to come into your life and make you a new person? Trust Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for, my, for our sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. Make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed this prayer and honestly believe the story that Jesus died and rose from the dead, we believe that you're born again, you're saved. We believe that when you die, you'll go to heaven. And there may be others of you who are already saved, know that you are, but for some reason or the other, you have walked away from God. For some reason or the other, you have fallen short. For some reason or the other, you wrestle with sin just like I do, <laughs> just like we all do. I want to pray with you and ask you to recommit, rededicate, reconnect to God. Lord Jesus will come lifting us before you. All of us who fall short, all of us who mess up, all of us who say the wrong thing, act the wrong way, do the wrong things, we ask you to forgive us. All of us who are pious, all of us who think we're better than other people, God, we ask you to forgive us for it. All of us that keep going through this cycle of sin, we ask you to forgive us. Cleanse us. Renew us, deliver us, that we, Father God, will walk with you and bless your name. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. 
There may be others of you who are in between church homes or don't have a church home. I rep recommend the New Beginning Church where you can come and be a part, whether you are local or whether you're global. You can be a part of the New Beginning Church. Just inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of the church. We'll be glad to connect with you and we'll be glad for you to be a part of our worship service. And if you're ever in the Houston area, come by and visit with us. We are at 4251 Sure My Road. Sure My spell S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. -E come by and visit with us. We'll be glad to have you. You'll be glad that you did. That's Houston, Texas, 77048. 4251 Sure My Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. 048 USA. Please come and be a part of our service. Thank you tonight for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service on tonight. Uh, we look forward to, to seeing you every Wednesday night as we look forward to seeing you for Sunday school on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And we also look forward to seeing you and hearing from you from you at 1030 a.m. on Sunday morning for our regular worship service. Thank you again for joining us. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can do so by two ways. Number one, you can mail your offering to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can... Uh, send your offering electronically to Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. We'll be so glad to receive your offering and give you an end of the year statement and you can file it on your taxes to the extent of the law. We thank you so much again for being a part to those who are joining us, whether you are far or near, to those who are members, those who are friends, those who are non-members, thank you for being with us and being a part of our worship service. Please, ma'am, please, sir, let us continue to do our Bible listening. We're doing our Bible listening. We're about halfway through the year. We're doing our Bible listening where, where we are listening. If you're listening to me and, and you don't have our Bible listening uh, schedule, inbox me and let me know and I'll be glad to send it to you. You can join us and pick up where we are and continue the rest of the year. And those of you who have fallen off, go ahead and catch up, catch up now and uh, continue to let God speak to you. We are, we're listening to the word of God and we're journaling what God is speaking to us. Come on and catch up. And also, uh, uh, every uh, Monday morning, I look forward to sending you our daily reading that leads up to our Bible study, our Sunday school, rather, our daily reading. So we're reading the word daily and we're listening to the word daily. We're journaling as we listen and we're studying the word of God daily as we lead up to our Sunday school on, on Sunday, Sunday morning. So again, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're looking forward to getting your, your report cards. Those of you who did not turn into your report cards so far, Go ahead and turn your report cards in so we can continue to pray with you and pray for you. We're looking forward to God doing a great thing. Congratulations to all the graduates, whether you're graduating from kindergarten to elementary, elementary to junior high, elementary to middle school, uh, high school to college, or high school to the workforce, or college to the workforce. We're praying with you and praying for you. Thank you so much for turning in your report card. We celebrate you. We celebrate what God is doing in your life. We continue to pray for you and do those things that will lift you up <laughs> into another plane. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for this privilege of giving. Bless every giver. Bless every person who gives. Bless the increase, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you so much for giving to the New Beginning Church. We're here at the New Beginning Church. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, 
will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, be power, be glory, in dominion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God.